Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Sister Colleen Gibson. I'm a Sister of St. Joseph of Philadelphia, and we're so happy to have you with us tonight for a conversation about women deacons now. Uh, just by way of a bit of introduction, so some people have submitted questions online in advance of tonight's conversation. But as we move through the evening, you'll have the opportunity, you can send uh, questions to me. I'll kind of act as our moderator tonight and deal the questions to Phyllis just because there's so many people on the call tonight. So if you have a question as you're listening and you want to submit that, you can access the chat function, which is if you scroll right over the bottom of your screen, you'll see chat and you can send it directly to me, questions directly to me, and then I'll add those to my list to send to Phyllis. So um, we're going to start tonight. Our, our evening is really broken into two parts. And so we'll begin, Phyllis will give us a little bit of input and then we'll switch over to a question and answer format. And so hopefully what everyone is interested in, we'll be able to focus on and we'll get kind of what Phyllis is up to, uh, what's happening in the church and what's the state of women deacons now. Just a note that tonight's uh, conversation is being recorded and it'll be posted on Phyllis's website uh, in the coming weeks, so you can always go back and access this. And so by way of introduction, uh, tonight we're going to hear from Dr. Phyllis Zagano, who is the Senior Research Associate in Residence and Adjunct Professor of Religion at Hofstra University. She's the author and editor of 23 books in religious studies, including Holy Saturday, An Argument for the Restoration of the Female Diaconate in the Catholic Church. Dr. Zagano's recent books include Women Deacons, Past, Present, and Future, Women in Ministry, Mysticism and the Spiritual Quest, Ordination of Women to the Diaconate in Eastern Churches, and Women Deacons, Essays with Answers. Her newest offering, her forthcoming book, will be Women, Icons of Christ, which will appear in January of 2020 from Paulus Press, or somewhere after that. Her award-winning Just Catholic column runs monthly in the National Catholic Reporter and in other journals around the world. Her work has won numerous awards and has been translated around the world. As many of you know, in August of 2016, Pope Francis appointed her to the Papal Commission for the Study of Women in the Diaconate, which was submitted its report to the Pope in 2018 and which is being reconvened. And so, it's a great pleasure to be able to engage her in conversation on this important topic, and I think we're all excited to be here and hear from her, and so I'm going to hand it over to Phyllis. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Colleen. It's, it's, uh, it's really a privilege to be able to talk to folks who are interested in the topic and to get your questions because it informs my own thought and prayer and also uh, my writing and speaking. I, uh, I spent some time today on Illinois Public Radio uh, talking about the topic, and, and I find that there's increasing interest uh, across the country and across the world in, in, this, in this topic. As you know, uh, it was a major uh, topic of discussion during the recent Synod for the Pan-Amazon. Uh, at least, we don't know exactly the numbers, but at least four or five of the, langu of the 12 language groups uh, absolutely requested uh, the restoration of the female diaconate in the Catholic Church. And uh, at the end of the Synod, the Holy Father said, I, I have heard you. I have heard you. I will recall the commission. And some reports say uh, he also said, or that at least uh, it appears, <clears throat> that he will add people to the commission. Um, and that's all I know. There is nothing official about the commission being reconvened. I have asked Cardinal Adaria, who's the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, and he has responded saying there's nothing official and, um, you know, we just don't know what, what will happen going forward. Um, I understand that the topic has, at least up until today, had not been discussed uh, with the C6, the, uh, the Cardinal uh, kitchen cabinet, if you will, that the Holy Father convenes in Rome, and which met in Rome from the 2nd to the 4th of December. Uh, actually talking more about the, uh, the reconfiguration of the Curia, but one thing that did come out was a greater role for uh, laymen and women in dicastery or in, in curial offices. Um, but I, I in, in previous conversations with members of the C9, uh, I was told that women deacons had not yet come up. Uh, 
having, having said that, uh, we, we know it is a topic uh, that people are bringing to their ad limitum meetings that certain bishops in the United States have had the, uh, uh, the foresight to uh, ask at various dicasteries and of the Pope himself uh, about the question of women deacons. Uh, now, what, what are the problems? Well, briefly, many of you know this. Um, the, the, there's the argument of history. And I think the argument of history is particularly interesting and interesting to me at this point, because just last Friday, uh, Pope Benedict, Pope Emeritus Benedict uh, the 16th, uh, sent a missive to the uh, International Theological Commission, which was meeting in Rome, and they had many celebrations because it is their 50th uh, anniversary of the founding of the International Theological Commission, which is part of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And in the, in the letter uh, that Pope Benedict uh, sent, uh, he, he made mention of the kinds and, and types of documents that the uh, ITC was able to produce and said that really, realistically speaking, while they do comment on doctrine, it is now uh, synodal, uh, post-synodal exhortations of the Holy Father that make the difference, if you will. And if you put this together with the fact that the Synod on the Amazon has just completed uh, and paragraph 103 um, is a fairly strong comment about women in the diaconate, there's an earlier paragraph, um, and I'd have to direct you to the Spanish of the uh, of the uh, post-synodal document. This is not an official document now. This, isn't, this is not a uh, apostolic exhortation, but this is the document that came out of the syn synod. Um, in, in a prior, uh, uh, prior paragraph, uh, there is the comment in Spanish that basically the, the ministries of lector and acolyte should be open both equally to men and to women. And I can tell you in the unofficial uh, translation given to media at the synod, <clears throat> that sentence was dropped. Uh, the English translation. Now I'll just uh, assume that was a little mistake, but in any event, it didn't hit the English language news as, as broadly as it might have. Uh, that's important because in today's world, in order to be ordained a deacon, one must first be installed a lector and then an acolyte. Um, as a little footnote to that, in 2008, the, uh, a synod of bishops voted to restore, to allow women to be formally installed as lectors and nothing happened. So uh, I wouldn't hold your breath, but the Holy Father did, as I said earlier, say he was going to open up uh, the commission again, and I, I don't know anything more than that. But <clears throat> let me just, uh, before we get to question, let me just read you this footnote because I find it fascinating. Um, An exception is in some way constituted by the document on the diaconate published in 2003. Um, that, is, that is an exception to the prior documents that were prepared by the ITC. Um, elaborate on behalf of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which was to provide an orientation regarding the question of the diaconate, in particular with regard to the question of, of whether this sacramental ministry could also be given to women. The document elaborated with great care and did not reach a univocal result regarding a possible diaconate of women. It was decided to refer the matter to the patriarchs of the Eastern churches. However, only a very few responded. And it, it appeared that the question that was posed as such uh, could not be understood in the Eastern traditions. <clears throat> Thus, the extensive study concluded with the assertion that the purely historical perspective <coughs> did not allow for any definitive certainty to be reached. In the final, uh, final analysis, the question had to be decided on the doctrinal level. Uh, well, that was uh, probably around 2005 and nothing's happened since, because as you will recall, that particular document said, well, um, men and women deacons don't seem to be exactly the same given the nature of their ordinations and the ministries they performed. However, number two, uh, in the long tradition uh, and magisterial teachings of the church, uh, the diaconate and the priesthood are separate. So therefore, this is something that the uh, ministry of discernment that the Lord has left his church um, <clears throat> to decide. Again, with translations, there's another interesting point. On point number two, uh, it's much, much stronger in the original French. Uh, the English is quite weak. The English actually began as an unofficial translation. So if you're looking to the conclusions of the 2002-2003 document, I would look to the original French. In any event, the point I'm trying to make here is 
the, uh, decided to refer the matter to the patriarchs of the Eastern churches. There are six Eastern churches um, that have patriarchs in the, Catholic, in the Catholic tradition. The Coptic Church of Alexandria, the Antiochian in Syria, the Greek Melkite also in Syria, the Maronites in Lebanon, the Chaldeans in Iraq, and the Armenians in Cilicia. Of those, uh, the Armenians have a deep history of women deacons. The Armenian Orthodox, they who are not in union with Rome, uh, actually ordain women as deacons to this day. They never stopped. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Maronites in the uh, Holy Synod of Mount Lebanon in 1743 uh, created canons, and one canon says, well, Bishop, you can ordain women as deacons, and the other canon says, and by the way, this is what they do for a living. So that's just the 18th century. Uh, and when you talk to Maronites today, they say, yeah, women deacons are no big deal. So um, I think the, the, the question then when they say, well, it's a doctrinal question, uh, that becomes, well, can a woman receive holy order? Uh, and, and, and I have been told by my, to my face by a, uh, an official of the, of the uh, Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith that women cannot be ordained because women cannot image Christ. And I suggested that that was heretical, um, but it kind of doesn't matter because he's the official and I'm not. Um, the other problem uh, there is what's called the unicity of order, that uh, the argument that you can only be ordained a deacon if you're also, at least uh, in theory, eligible to be a priest or a bishop. And since women <coughs> are not able to be, uh, or are not authorized or not, not able to be ordained as priests in the Catholic Church, according to magisterial teaching in 1994 with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, and uh, further back in 1976 with Inter and Signores, um, therefore, you can't be deacons, uh, and you know that uh, it's 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 kind of uh, difficult to uh, uh, to to understand that kind of logic, uh, particularly when you look at the history of Canon 1024 that says only a baptized male validly receives sacred ordination, and you understand that sacred ordination at the time that canon began only meant priesthood, and no one who was not going to be a priest could be ordained a deacon. We have women ordained as deacons to the 12th century. That may be enough for now. Otherwise, um, uh, maybe I'll hit pause and, and we can get some questions in. Great, Phyllis. Thanks for that really good groundwork to begin on. Um, you mentioned a number of things that kind of hit on questions that people have asked. And I remind you that you can send questions directly to me using the chat function here on Zoom or via email. Um, Phyllis, a set of questions came in about uh, women deacons in the early church. So maybe if you could go there. Um, one of the questions was really about function. You know, how did deaconesses function in the early church? And how do or how can women deacons, how would they function today? Would it be a similar means of functioning or what's the history there? Well, let's back it up a little. You know, at the Synod on the Amazon, one of the main things that was spoken about was that two thirds, fully two thirds of the parishes in the Amazonia uh, were run by women. Uh, and, and that was uh, marked as a need uh, for, for women deacons because um, you want to have that kind of a connection with the bishop to bring the ministry of the whole church to the whole church. Uh, legalistically, uh, women deacons uh, today and men deacons can uh, solemnly baptize without special permission, can witness marriages without special permission, uh, can preach, can serve as single judges in annulment proceedings. Now, if we go back to the early church and we just think about, for example, annulment proceedings, the Holy Father, I think so far as three or four times spoken about a Syrian professor who told him about the functions of women deacons in the early church. And one of the functions that they had uh, was to receive the, uh, uh, the complaint on behalf of the bishop, receive the complaint of a woman who accused her husband of beating her. And the, uh, the woman deacon would make the assessment as to whether this was, would, was a true complaint uh, and would report to the bishop. Now, now, is she rendering a judgment of nullity? <laughs> on behalf of the bishop uh, to allow the woman to, uh, uh, to leave her husband? I don't know, but I, I find that, and I had never heard that before the Holy Father mentioned it when he spoke to the, uh, 
women religious in May of 2016. Uh, the usual thing you will hear is that, well, women deacons only assisted with uh, uh, adult female baptism, which took place um, unclothed, and we don't do that anymore, so we don't need women deacons. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, women deacons actually were the anointers of the, uh, uh, the baptizande. Um, I, I translated a very interesting article about this and could not for the life of me figure out what this guy was talking about. And finally, we figured out that there was a curtain um, set up between the baptismal pool and the bishop. <clears throat> and the women and the women deacons were on one side. And at the appropriate time, the bishop would stick his hand through the, through the curtain without seeing anything and bless, bless the woman. Uh, but uh, we don't know exactly where or when exactly uh, people, women deacons uh, ministered. We know that they anointed. Uh, Danielo says that he felt that the anointing of women, uh, ill women, was sacramental in nature. Um, <clears throat> Samer Nasser, the patriarch of, uh, Maronite patriarch of Damascus in Syria, said the same thing to me. He said, of course it would be, because you would have to have an ordained woman to go to the village, to go into a woman's house, to perform the sacrament. You would never send anybody um, who was not ordained uh, to, to perform a, a sacred ministry. We know that women deacons carried, uh, carried the sacrament to ill women. Um, we know that as, as the uh, uh, diaconate moved, uh, for, for women at least, began to move into monasteries and abbeys, the abbess was typically ordained a deacon, but other women were also ordained as deacons uh, to lead the liturgy um, and also to preach. Uh, we, we do have evidence that, that women deacons, uh, uh, at least in their own abbeys, would, would preach. So, uh, so historically, some of the jobs that women deacons performed actually exceeded things that men deacons uh, performed. And then we have in, individuals, uh, Anna, the treasurer of Rome, you know, she managed the money. It's, it's a, uh, an historical fact that the deacons, particularly in Rome, uh, were very, very powerful and handled the, the church funds. Um, so much so that by the time you get to the 10th, 11th, 12th century, um, the priests are, are annoyed enough with the deacons to try to uh, uh, codify what's called the cursus honorum, the course of honor. And so no one eventually, with Gresham in 1140, no one uh, is ordained a deacon um, unless he is in the cursus honorum to become a priest. And, and that's kind of the death knell for women deacons. The last women deacons we know of were ordained around the 12th century, <clears throat> and we know Otone and Luca had women deacons, and probably social service women deacons as well, not monastic uh, women deacons. So I hope that answers some of the questions. Uh, the bottom line is different places, different times. We don't know exactly uh, what they did. We know some of what they did. Um, different times, different places. What can they do? Of course they can do things. Big thing we know they did, because Pope Gelasius complains about it, is they served at the altar. And uh, there, there was great consternation uh, on his part. Um, these are probably Eastern women deacons. You know, the, the Eastern church never had the hangups about um, menstruation that the Western church had. And so uh, in Sicily, we know uh, women deacons were serving at the altar. They were mixing the water and the wine, uh, probably participating uh, vocally in the mass. Uh, and, 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 and so it went. Uh, <clears throat> It, Phyllis, in the midst of the conversations earlier, you talked about the different rites in which, you know, female diaconate is still in existence. Has there been any commentary from those rites on kind of what's happening in the Roman rite right now? Well, these are different churches um, and, and the different churches of, of the patriarchal churches, and the Eastern Catholic churches. I just found this out today that they were polled. I mean, I know some of the history of these, uh, the Coptic uh, Church in Alexandria and the Catholic Church uh, doesn't necessarily have, have uh, uh, I, I haven't been in touch with them uh, in Egypt, but, uh, but, but I do know that the, uh, the Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria ordained five women as deacons just last November. And some people say, oh, no, no, they were only subdeacons. Well, I don't care because the subdiaconate is a major order as well. Um, the, uh, the Maronites, as I said, uh, uh, it's part of their history. The Maronites are the only um, Eastern Catholic Church that never really left uh, left uh, Rome. Uh, uh, 
um, there's, there's one part of the Maronite church that at one point was under an Eastern patriarch, but, but the others, uh, the Chaldean, the Armenian, the Greek Melkite, um, are all, uh, have counterparts in Orthodoxy. And as I said, the Armenians, at least for those of Cilicia, um, never left, never stopped having women as deacons. You can actually on 2nd Avenue and 34th Street in New York City, there's a bookstore at the Armenian Cathedral where you can buy a book that shows pictures of women deacons. Um, and I'm not, I'm not real clear on the rest, uh, but, it, but there, is, there is a history there uh, and a deeper history. In Syria, um, East Syria has a deep, and I know this from Professor Susan Harvey at Brown, East Syria has a deep history of women deacons chanting and teaching and which of course goes up against Paul's admonition or so-called admonition of Paul that women shouldn't uh, speak in church, that she has, uh, she has a great deal of history of, of women, particularly women deacons singing uh, and preaching uh, in, in church. But uh, I'm not an expert on the East. I'm only beginning to take a look at this. I will say though, that um, with the churches whose, whose, uh, whose orders and sacrament we agree uh, to recognize the Eastern churches where we, <clears throat> they're not in union with Rome, but we do recognize the validity uh, and certainly the laicity of their order. Um, we recognize their order, but they have ne we have never said anything about uh, the, that the, the, the validity of their ordained women deacons. Um, the Holy, uh, let's see, the Greek, the Synod, the Holy Synod of, of um, the Orthodox Church of Greece in 2004 voted to restore the female diaconate. Um, other churches uh, of the East have restored the, the female diaconate. Uh, some Union of Utrecht churches uh, have female deacons only. In the Czech Republic, they only have uh, women deacons. They don't have women priests. So, But we've never said anything about, about their orders. You see, because if you say that their order ordering the, the women deacons is Ill, invalid, illegal, fattening, or anything else, then you are uh, really um, damaging your relations with these, uh, these other churches. If you agree that the women are, are validly ordained, well, then what about us? Um, uh, which I, I think I asked in, a, in an article some time ago. Very interesting. Um... Phyllis, a question, you talked about the semantics there of uh, subdeacon versus a deacon. And one of the questions that came in is, um, is there a distinction between deaconess and woman deacon? Or is that simply a matter of semantics? Uh, well, it's, it's less, than, less semantics and more simply language. Um, one, uh, there's a very early reference that was sent to me by John N. Collins uh, in, in, uh, in Australia where he found deacon woman in Greek, um, <clears throat> and I prefer woman deacon. Um, as, as, language, uh, as language grew, uh, women deacons were called deaconesses, you know, just because that's the way the language is. I'm a professoressa in, in Italy, and I don't get annoyed when people say that. Um, other languages have gone back on that. You, you no longer have stewardesses, you have flight attendants, you know. Uh, and I like to say to folks, you know, a deacon is a job title. Deacon's a job title. So when you call a plumber and a, a female shows up, you don't call her a plumberess, you know? Um, <clears throat> now, it's confused by the fact that some women called deaconesses would have been the wives of, of deacons or probably, more probably, the wives of, of bishops. Uh, but we have plenty of literary epigraphical evidence. We, Uta Eisen uh, has a, a very good book. We have uh, uh, tombstones where they're called deacons, um, <clears throat> you know. Um, and, and again, the deacon Anna uh, of Rome is called the deacon Anna. If Anna was a guy, she had trouble in fifth grade, I'll tell you. But, you know, it, I, I think we, <clears throat> we need to go beyond um, trying to, to argue uh, based on a feminization of, of a, a job title. Uh, I, I think it, it's better to look at uh, the ceremonies that with which these women were, <clears throat> were brought into, were created deacons and the, uh, the, ways, uh, the ways in which they worked. Uh, the, the, those, those points, and if we're gonna deal with history, 
are, are far, far more important. And the ceremonies are tremendously important. Uh, the ceremonies, <clears throat> of which there are many, there are five in the, in the apostolic, uh, Vatican Apostolic Library alone, three, uh, three from the East and two from the West. Um, ceremonies typically uh, take place inside the iconostasis, in, inside the altar rail. The bishop is saying a mass. The, the, the other clergy are there, the deacons, uh, deaconesses, if you wish, uh, the, the priests. Um, the, the bishop lays his hand on the, uh, uh, on the woman deacon and invokes the Holy Spirit. It's called the epiclesis or epiclesis. <clears throat> and, and if you look at Greek liturgy, that's, that's the, it's the Greeks who explained to us that the one who does the heavy lifting in all sacraments is the, is the Holy Spirit. So you can't tell me that the Holy Spirit can't do it because it's a girl. Anyway, the bishop uh, puts a stole called an Orion on the woman and most importantly calls her a deacon. Uh, if, she, if she wasn't a deacon, um, he would call her something else. Uh, <clears throat> so <coughs> I think that, uh, I think that is, uh, we can look into antiquity um, and in order to say that the women deacons ordained in these ceremonies were not actually ordained um, is to impugn the integrity and the intent of the ordaining bishop. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, I just ordered a book. I have it, I have it uh, electronically, but I want to have the book uh, by Gibault, G-I-B-A-U-L-T. It's uh, about the cursus honorum. And Gibault <clears throat> actually matches some uh, bishops with, uh, with women they ordained. And so that's my next project. If anybody wants to pitch in is to try to identify the ceremonies that were used uh, by the various uh, uh, bishops who are, and, and the other women deacons that we know they ordained. <coughs> mm. Well, we'll maybe we'll get a book club going for you, Phyllis. Ah. Maybe that'll work. A <laughs> uh, question that just came in on the, uh, on the private chat. Um, someone was, is talking about the connection that's often made between uh, female ordination of the priesthood and a female ordination of the diaconate. And um, talking about, in some circles, people say that uh, having women deacons might be a step back from, uh, from the focus on equality through ordination of the priesthood. Could you talk about how those are often linked together and if that's a proper connection to make, if they're mutually exclusive, uh, and what role you know, the role of having women deacons would play in equality in the church for women, an equal role. Well, I don't know. You know, equality is kind of becomes a loaded word and it makes it a political discussion. Um, <clears throat> the diacon is not the priesthood. Women deacons, women were never in the cursus honorum, if you want to go in that direction. Uh, by the time in the Middle Ages, you had established the progression of steps from tonsure to lector to uh, exorcist to uh, <clears throat> porter to acolyte to subdeacon and then deacon. Um, by the time that got solidified, only men on the path to priesthood even began the first step. Um, so the the trajectory towards priesthood is is really um, <clears throat> just not there uh, because it is established actually in the Middle Ages. Um, there is some evidence of women having performed priestly duties, but uh, in some cases those are among heretical sects. Uh, and I have not found, and I don't think anyone else has found, any ordination ceremonies for women to be priests. So then that bounces you back to the history uh, discussion, which does not, I don't think, obviate the theological discussion, but it's just one that I don't have, because I don't think it's useful at this time. Uh, <clears throat> the church, um, I was told many years ago by the highest ranking woman in the Vatican at the time, she worked in justice and peace. I was told they can't say no, uh, they just don't want to say yes. And I think that uh, even reading this uh, footnote from Benedict the Sixteenth, I see um, a stonewalling and, a, and a, a do nothing attitude. I mean, the, <clears throat> the uh, findings can't change. Uh, uh, the same conversation has been going on for 400 years. In the 17th century, Jean Morin investigated all of the liturgies uh, extant in, <clears throat> in uh, Syriac, in, uh, uh, in uh, Greek, and in Latin. And he determined then, around 1655, that these ceremonies met 
the criteria for sacramental ordination according to the Council of Trent, the, the, the rules set down for sacrament according to the Council of Trent. <clears throat> so, um, of course, 100 years later, you had someone else saying, oh, no, they didn't. And then uh, the conversation uh, expanded. We're now coming up, I think, on about the 50th anniversary or the 40th anniversary of the ordinations in Philadelphia of 13 uh, Episcopal women. And it's at that time that the discussion about Roman Catholic women priests uh, began to, to gather, gather uh, uh, momentum. And I think that clouded a lot of the serious discussion that was going on in Rome even then in the early 70s uh, after Vatican II when the diaconate was restored as permanent, uh, as permanent vocation uh, for our church uh, to include married men, which is very interesting, you see, because um, <clears throat> the church has a history of... Uh, not wanting, at least the Western church, not wanting married men near the sacred. Uh, why not? Well, because if you touch a woman, then you're unclean. I mean, that's as simple as that. Uh, so so the, the, the fact that they would allow, uh, and this was a discussion among the 101 pr uh, propositions about the diaconate at, uh, at Second Vatican Council, this was a discussion on whether they would admit married men to it. But in the end, it was, it was determined that since the deacon did not perform the sacrifice, that it was okay to have married uh, married deacons, <clears throat> of which there are 45,000 in the world today. Good statistic. Uh, Phyllis, a question to kind of move us from history into uh, present day. One of the questions that came in uh, in advance of tonight's conversation was about obstacles. And so the questioner asks, what would be the biggest obstacle you see for women to become deacons? Well, I think obtuseness on the part of the uh, clergy. Uh, and, and I mean that uh, sincerely and, and uh, honestly. <clears throat> there are some clergy, clerics, uh, who just can't handle the idea that a woman uh, can receive the grace and charism of order. And I think um, underneath that is their almost hysterical reaction to seeing the possibility of seeing a woman vested. And then you add to that a woman vested in a Dalmatic holding the gospel in St. Peter's Basilica next to the Pope and, and they, they, they'll faint. Uh, you know, it's, it's misogyny uh, and it's uh, ignorance. Uh, and I think it's helping to drive, uh, drive our church into a further hole. We have 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. Half of them are, are women. Uh, and for the church not to symbolically allow women on the altar, I think it is for the church to symbolically say women are less than human. You know, the Querelle de Femme of the Middle Ages argued that women were subspecies, that women were not even human. And uh, I find uh, vestiges of this in some of the conversations I've had uh, with, with some clerics. Uh, and uh, among American clerics, American bishops, some of them are very political. They, um, they, they just don't even engage the question. Um, <clears throat> in, in Rome, I've had uh, uh, clerics, mostly from Africa, who recoil at the idea. And one uh, African cardinal said, why are you shoving your American ideas down my throat? I said, nobody's shoving anybody's ideas down anybody's throat. He's a retired cardinal, but you know, I said, well, your Episcopal conference would have to agree uh, to, to have women as deacons in your Episcopal uh, territory, and then individual bishops uh, would, would decide what they want to do. You know, in, in, um, in Ireland, Colleen, in Ireland, uh, only in the past several years uh, has, has, uh, have deacons been ordained. I think it's only in the past 10 years they started ordaining, or it started training women as deacons, uh, started training deacons men to become deacons and about half of the Irish uh, of the Irish um, uh, diocese don't have a diaconate at all and some Irish bishops have told me that that's because they can't have women deacons they don't want to put in a layer a clerical layer between themselves and the people who are doing the work of the church um, who and that redounds you know that brings me back around to the Amazon um, the uh, Father Sosa, the, uh, the uh, Father General of the Jesuits, told me uh, uh, about a year ago, uh, he knew of a church in Venezuela that had 14, uh, 14 uh, missions or 14 little chapels up in the hills, 
um, and uh, only two priests. Well, who's going to run those chapels? You know, it's almost like in the time of St. Ignatius, uh, where they had the Sororas in Basque territory. The Sororas are really the closest we have <clears throat> in, uh, in modern times to, to women deacons. And uh, actually, on his last trip home, Ignatius stayed, uh, stayed with uh, the Sororas. He didn't go to his family castle. He stayed with the women who were running this uh, kind of hospital chapel. Um, uh, in, in vast territory. So, so uh, I, I think that, uh, I think, I think that the, uh, the church will need to, the, the, the clerics who are upset about women will just have to get over it um, because uh, women are walking away. Women are disgusted uh, with the way they are viewed and treated uh, in the church. Um, so, and we've had a couple of uh, comments in the chat about that, you know, women's reactions and women's roles uh, in the church and especially uh, someone citing the national NCR talking about in Germany, how women are boycotting the church. Um, a a follow-up question to that question on obstacles that the questioner asks is, um, do we need a new or a more uh, developed theology of the diaconate uh, in order to move forward? not, you know, a reworking, but a, a better understanding of the diaconate. Do you think that would be helpful? Well, that's always helpful. You know, uh, the church, uh, the Holy Father has said it's not a museum. Um, <clears throat> where the church has become a museum, the church is dead. Uh, you mentioned Germany, only 9% of registered Catholics attend church in Germany. Um, and, and I think it's something like 20% in the United States. So to have, um, to have a, uh, uh, a develop a more developed theology of the diaconate. The diaconate, uh, you know, was was reinstituted as a permanent grade of order um, following the Second Vatican Council, and different countries uh, brought it back uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 10 years ago, and um, uh, as it, it it develops as it is needed. And this is why the history question is so difficult because. The diaconate in, in Germany is not the same as the diaconate in Ireland or the diaconate in the United States. And the diaconate in some parts of the United States is not the same as the diaconate in other parts of the United States. The diaconate in Canada, I know, is different from the diaconate in many places in the United States uh, because I had several conversations with the primate of Canada, Cardinal Lacroix, who said every deacon uh, has an assignment to his home, his parish, uh, you know, a liturgical assignment to his parish, but also has another assignment to a hospital or a nursing home or a prison or to a soup kitchen, has some kind of ministerial work. Um, in the United States, I attended the Mass and there was a deacon at the Mass and I greeted him when I left the Mass. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm the deacon. I said, well, I, I figured that out, but um, what do you do? He said, I'm an accountant. I said, no, what's your work? And he, he just was totally blank. Uh, he, he just didn't know what I was talking about. So, you know, to, to avoid what uh, one American cardinal called Sunday dress up guys, I think there needs to be, at least in the United States, a more developed understanding of what it means to be a deacon, to be in persona Christi survey, if you wish to take the, uh, the term in the 2003 document, or to work in Omni Ecclesiae, which is the, the earlier term before, uh, uh, to my mind, the ITC tried to freeze uh, freeze women out of the diaconate. You know, that ITC document's very interesting. It's 30,000 words uh, and only about uh, 3,000, fewer than 3,000 words about women deacons. Uh, it, it, it follows on, adds on a, a unpublished document in uh, 1997 that Cardinal Ratzinger refused to sign. <clears throat> and I'm told by two members of that ITC commission, subcommission, that <clears throat> it said, yeah, women deacons are no big deal. They can be ordained. And the, the document was printed and numbered uh, and uh, voted on uh, unanimously by the ITC. And Ratzinger refused to sign it and created a new subcommission, which uh, wrote this 2002-2003 document, uh, which waffles the question, uh, basically. It, it can, as I said earlier, it can't say no. It just doesn't want to say yes. Uh, Phyllis, you talked about the ITC document. Can you just um, flesh that out for some people are looking for it? 
Well, you just go, you mean looking for it, go to the... Uh, yeah, what would you Google if you were looking for it? Well, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, International Theological Commission, documents, and then you will come uh, in English, it's called From the Diaconate of uh, Christ to the Diaconate of the Apostles or something like that. It's an inaccurate translation. And uh, <clears throat> it was originally published only in French. And then a uh, unofficial translation came out in English. And since then, it's in something like nine languages on the internet. Uh, and some of them are dated 2003 and some of them are dated 2002. I would recommend, if you can do it, to check <coughs> your preferred language against the French, which is the original and is really the official uh, language of that particular document. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, it's only got about 10% of that document actually refers to women deacons. The rest of the document attempts to create a theology of the uh, diaconate that is, to my mind, uh, highly um, iconically linked to priesthood. Um, they try to drag the, uh, the iconic argument that only a man represents Christ from the 1976 inter in Signores into this 2002 document. And this is even after um, Pope, uh, Pope uh, John Paul II dropped the iconic argument in 1994 with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis uh, about women priests. Uh, uh, it's just, it's just a, a, bad, uh, a bad argument and it, it, it just bleeds misogyny uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the, the way the church uh, can be seen to speak about women. It's, it's, it's really a, a disgrace uh, to <clears throat> have your whole document, your whole argument resting in the fact that women uh, cannot image Christ. Uh, of course, we can't image the, uh, the human Jesus, but that's not what we're talking about. And in any sacrament anyway, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not the priest, it's not the people, it's, it's, the, it's the Holy Spirit that, as, as Bob Taft always said to me, it's the Holy Spirit that does the heavy lifting in all sacraments. So, uh, uh, and we are, we are just the vehicles. <clears throat> Mm. Well, thank, thanks for that guidance, Phyllis. Uh, question, building off the Holy Spirit that you just brought up that um, came in was, uh, the questioner is talking about canon law. It says, you know, the Holy Spirit inspires the people of God who bring their inspiration to the hierarchy, and then the hierarchy uh, bring that to their own discernment. And so, um, do you see that happening in the church? But I think also as a follow-up, some of the questions that are coming in, um, talking about really the role of the people of God, the role of the faithful, um, what would you see that as, and how do you think people could really work to influence and speak on behalf of this topic? Influ I don't like the word influence, but, but speaking up I think is important. Synodal, the synodal way, the walking together, we see the example in Germany now they have a, I think, almost a two-year process where they're going to be talking about the needs of the church in, in Germany. Uh, when the Holy Father named 184 men uh, as voting members of the uh, Synod for the Pan Amazon and something 80, 85 auditors, he included, uh, I think, 33 women um, in, in, in that group. But it was a very diverse group. Uh, of indigenous individuals, of bishops, of cardinals, of, of priests, of lay people. Uh, all the voting members were, uh, were clerics, with one exception, a, a, a brother um, who was nominated by the uh, Union of Superiors General, the men's counterpart to the International Union of Superiors General, the women's group that represents 1900 um, uh, women uh, superiors and generals around the world. Uh, but the synodal way uh, is, is very important because those people, those, those, you know, some 200 and I can't do the math now, what, 250, say, people came bringing, uh, bringing what they had, uh, they prepared for two years for this. They came prepared having asked their communities, having asked their diocese, having asked the people of God. So, um, so that's one way uh, to, to do it. In order to have your voice heard, uh, I know that there are various uh, organizations. Uh, there's an organization in, in the Midwest, I think it's in Ohio, called Future Church, that actually has a program uh, now uh, for people to contact their American bishops, the bishops in the United States, in advance of their um, ad limina visits. You know, every five years, or in this case, seven years, um, uh, the bishops <coughs> of the United States visit 
go ad limited, go to the to to the to the uh, to the threshold of the Holy Father, and they have a, a group meetings uh, with all the dicasteries, with CDF, with Oriental churches, with communications, with uh, family and laity, uh, with congregation of the doctrine of faith. And then the last person that they meet with as a group for about two hours in a free for all conversation is the Holy Father, and. <clears throat> What Future Church is recommending, and, and other groups I think have done the same, uh, is that people contact their bishops and say, this is what I want you to tell the Holy Father. This is what I want you to tell the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. This is what I want you to tell, um, you know, Oriental churches or, or worship, divine worship. Um, and, and, and I think the bishops of the world uh, are, are getting it in a sense, are understanding that they, they are uh, the, the leaders of the whole church, they're responsible for us. Well, if they're responsible for us, they should know what we think and what we need. I published an article <clears throat> in, uh, in September in a thing called Review of Religion Research with a, a, a Boston, uh, Boston College Jesuit named Eric Berelza, who's a sociologist. And we studied the, uh, or we wrote about three uh, sociological studies about what people thought in the United States about women deacons. One was a professional study conducted by CARA, um, the Center for Applied uh, Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown University. Uh, one of the CARA, there were two CARA studies. One was done uh, by America Magazine, <clears throat> just of women. And, and the women, you know, what do you think about women deacons? And that came out about 78% positive for women deacons. Another was another professional study, this one done by, also by CARA, and it, it interviewed or, or it reviewed the, uh, uh, the thoughts of uh, received, received questionnaires from the heads of men's and women's religious orders and institutes throughout the United States. And that came out about 74% positive. And that's very interesting when you think of some of the very, very, very conservative women's institutes and orders that responded. And then the third that we, we uh, looked at was a kind of an online thing that was done by uh, US Catholic. And that was in response to an article that I wrote about women deacons. And <clears throat> even despite the fact that uh, uh, some right-wing bloggers tried to interrupt the study, it still came out 74%. So on average, we found that something 74, 75% of U.S. Catholics said, yeah, no big deal. Uh, you know, yes, we, we need women as deacons. Um, there was another study separately done by CARA <clears throat> of deacons, deacon directors and bishops in the United States, and only about half of them felt that it, it would happen, uh, but almost all of them said that if it did happen, they could use them. So <laughs> they could use women deacons. So, um, but we need to, to keep telling bishops that you know, uh, to keep reminding them, this is a serious question. This is not um, something about power. This is about representing uh, the needs of, of the people of God uh, to, to the ad limita, to, to, to Rome, uh, and, to, and to our own bishops. You know, uh, we want ministry, um, and we're not getting it. We're not getting it maybe because there are fewer priests, um, I, I am of the opinion we don't need more priests, we need more ministry. And whether that ministry is lay ecclesial ministry, the ministry is diaconal ministry, the ministry is priestly ministry. Obviously we need to be fed and nourished by the Eucharist, but, um, <clears throat> but without ministry, we have no church. And so um, to, to uh, uh, so your question was, what can people do? People can make noise. That's the Holy Father said to the youth synod, you know, make noise. Uh, make a mess, uh, you know, write letters to the editor, write op-eds, uh, make a phone call, uh, get on the radio. Uh, there are plenty of call-in shows. Uh, get on the internet, uh, talk on Facebook, uh, uh, let, let people know and let your bishop know. And you don't need to write him a 50-page letter. You know, people, people very kindly send me copies of some of the things they send their bishops. Um, you just need to send them three paragraphs and say, you know, this, this is important to me and my parish uh, here in, you know, Sterling Heights, Illinois. And, and we, need, uh, we need women deacons in, in our parish today. Uh, so. That's great, Phyllis. Um, one of the questions in points to make to bishops, um, what would you see as a way to, you know, you talked about the survey results among the faithful and among people in the pews. Uh, 
do you get the sense that there's discussion on the ground level? Are people aware that there's a conversation happening about women deacons in the church? You know, there is and there is not. It depends on the parish. Uh, I have a book called Women Deacons Past, Present, Future that is published in four languages. It's published in French, English, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, <clears throat> actually, copies of that book in all four languages were given to the particip participants in the Synod on the Amazon. But on my website, there's uh, free downloads for uh, study guides for each of these. And I, I know of parishes in North Carolina, uh, in New Jersey, in Massachusetts, just off the top of my head, that have taken the book <clears throat> and taken the study guides. It's a four chapter study guide, so it takes about four weeks, and talk, read the book, talked and prayed about it. Um, and, and from those groups, uh, I just saw today a letter that went, uh, I think it was signed by 20 members of a study group in North Carolina, who then had their parish, had the letter put before their parish and they gained another 165 signatures with a letter to their bishop saying, by the way, would you please bring this to, the, to your ad limina visit? Uh, so I, I think it's important to, and it doesn't matter, the study group doesn't have to be you know, 50 people or 15 people, it can be five people, um, <clears throat> just, to, just to talk about it um, because uh, I, I don't know what the answer will be. I'm not the Pope. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Um, I see my my need, you know, in, in our church. Um, but that's my my perspective. I think we need the perspective of the whole church, but an informed perspective, and and to to look at the books. Um, my, this particular book. I mean, I hate to sell my books here, but um, <clears throat> this particular book, which I did with Bill Dightwig, who used to run the Deacon. Uh, office at the USCCB, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and with Gary Macy, who's really a world-class historian out there at Santa Clara and now retired, um, called Women Deacons Past, Present, Future. I write about the future questions. Um, <clears throat> it's a simple book. And as I said, the study guide is four chapters. The introduction is done by Susan Ross, professor at, uh, Saint Louis, at uh, Loyola University in Chicago, also now retired. But, but to, to just talk about it and pray about it, I think that's the most, the most important. And then make your, make, maybe you say no. Uh, maybe, maybe you're not, you know, you think it's not a good idea. Uh, some people think it's not a good idea because it's, it's halfway. You know, women have to be priests. I say, well, you know, not going to happen. Uh, or some people say it's not, not a good idea because uh, it confuses the faithful or... Um, it's not a good idea because lay ministry does, uh, does everything it needs. In 2006, Cardinal Casper said, uh, oh, women don't need to be ordained as deacons. They can dress up and walk about the altar, but they can't be ordained uh, and they can do everything deacon does. But I was like, oh my goodness, you know. <clears throat> um, so I, I just make your, you know, make, make, your, make your wishes known. Phyllis, a set of questions came in in uh, regards to the Amazonian Synod. Um, and so one of the questions was, do you think that the decision on women in the diaconate in the Amazon will hasten women's ordination to the diaconate in the wider church much sooner? Or do you think it'll remain a question for a much longer time? I don't know. Um, I, think, I think the decision has to be made uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Vatican level, at the papal level, to say it can happen. Okay, the Pope has many, many times said to bishops' conferences, if you want married priests, just ask me. So uh, one of the questions in the Amazon was, we want married priests. Uh, in terms of uh, women deacons, he said, uh, I was over there in May, uh, May 10th, he spoke to uh, 900 members of the International Union of Superiors General. Um, and... Uh, he, he said something very interesting. He said, if I'm going to make a sacramental decree, I need more, more information. And everybody focused in on his needing more information. And I almost fell off my chair when he said sacramental decree, because uh, he's playing hardball here. Um, and so uh, if he makes a sacramental decree and says it's perfectly uh, okay for women to be restored to the ordained uh, diaconate, um, it would be up to Episcopal conferences. And, and it would appear that the Episcopal conferences in the Pan-Amazonia, Salem, um, <clears throat> uh, want women deacons. So it could start there. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Germany, I know, is very, very interested in, in the question. It was actually in Germany that the deacon uh, groups began in the 50s. It's, it's from Germany that the permanent diaconate uh, came back to our church, actually. The diaconate came back as a permanent ministry. <clears throat> so, and that came out of the uh, experience of, of World War, World War uh, II. So uh, it, it could happen, it could not happen. I, I don't know. Uh, it's not that I'm ambivalent, it's just that I'm <clears throat> unknowing. <laughs> Well, then I, you probably won't be able to answer the many people who asked, will this happen in my lifetime? Because you, you don't have that sense. But um, depends on how old you are. Yeah, <laughs> it's very true. Um, one of the questions that came in from the United States, and this is kind of connected to the Amazon, um, is that would you see it as uh, just whatever diocese asked for the diaconate uh, if, it, if it was to happen? that they would be granted it, or the question was from a missionary diocese in the United States uh, and asking if it would be more likely that the female diaconate would be implemented in missionary diocese versus the general public. Well, well you know, I can, I can use as an analogy um, in Alaska, um, actually almost 20 years ago, they asked for rescripts, <clears throat> which is a waiver, uh, to allow, um, lay ecclesial ministers to uh, witness marriages and perform baptisms. And it was out of necessity. But in order for them to ask for the rescript, <clears throat> they had to get the USCCB, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, to agree that um, they could ask. So um, I can't imagine that if a missionary territory in the United States or any place else in the world <clears throat> made its case to its Episcopal Conference that it would not be able to convince the Episcopal Conference to ask for women deacons uh, uh, to be allowed on a uh, diocesan by diocesan basis. I, I, a, a cardinal in Rome, I, 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 said, I asked this question, I said, what about the United States, you know, um, would... would um, uh, would the female diaconate fly in the United States? And he said, actually, he felt every single bishop, every single diocese would agree uh, to women deacons uh, should, it, should it be passed. And I mentioned a particular diocese in the United States that doesn't even have female altar service. And he said, well, that's not on this planet. You know, we'll just ignore that. But, but I, you know, you, you, again, it's the will of the people. Um, <clears throat> The will of, I mean, imagine if your bishop, um, if we were allowed to have women deacons and your bishop got up and said, I'm not having women deacons. And by the way, I'm not having female altar servers or lectors either. I mean, he would see the backs of more female heads than he ever saw in his life. Um, so I, I think it's to the point where women are recognizing that they are full members of this, this church and are, are deserving of the ministry of women. I mean, we didn't really talk about that. I write about it in, in my next book. The, the ministry of women to women, uh, women spiritual directors, uh, women confessors in history, um, <clears throat> uh, women chaplains certainly today, um, women, women chaplains in, in, um, in colleges, you know, uh, so many women chaplains in colleges and universities say, you know, we, we, bring, we bring these kids to, to, the, to the altar to be married and then we can't witness the wedding um, and baptism you know, and, 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 and similar sacraments. So I, I, think, I think it depends on the needs of the people of God. And I don't think, I don't think um, that, that uh, God uh, will allow people to be bereft of, of their needs. I, re I really don't. Uh, uh, but that's not up, up to me to say, uh, to do. It's up to me to say, because I say it a lot, but it's not up to me to do. I think that's a real uh, sign of hope Phyllis, and a question that came in um, as we were talking about this and talking about, you know, uh, even if you, as you say, you know, if the bishop got up and said this wasn't possible or, you know, women can't serve in any of these positions, if you'd see more backs of heads. Uh, the question that came in is a, a woman who says, you know, I, I'm staying, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, but, you know, my daughter calls me a hypocrite for staying. Um, so what do you see? What gives you hope? in the midst of all of this and in the midst of um, women trying to find a, a greater leadership role and, and the people of God finding their voice more and more? You know, I think, I think, you know, it redounds to your earlier question, the people of God finding their voice. Yes, a lot of what I see seems hypocritical. We have seen um, 
untold, untold numbers of women should be more involved. Uh, women should be more involved in leadership. Women should be more involved in, well, you know, put your money where your mouth are. That <clears throat> there are certain uh, leadership roles in the church that cannot be held or fully held unless the individual is a clerk. A, a woman uh, canon lawyer cannot be a single judge in an annulment proceeding or any other judicial proceeding. Uh, uh, she therefore cannot render the judgment of nullity on behalf of the bishop, even though in Syria, probably in the fourth and fifth century, she could. Um, so, because she was a deacon, um, uh, a woman cannot preach, and and this is something very neuralgic that we haven't touched upon. Uh, but uh, only a cleric involved in a certain mass can uh, can preach at that mass. Um, with one exception in 1992, where you know people people who are better able to speak to children can can talk to them at children's masses. But um, so you know, my my hope is that people will keep making their needs known, uh, both in in person to their bishops and in prayer to our dear Lord, because uh, because that's the only only thing that's going to um, going to move move the uh, uh, move the issue. Um, the problem, I think, is that uh, the goalpost in the past, in the recent past, has has kept being moved. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, I don't know, just keep talking about it and hope. It is the season of hope, after all. <laughs> that is expectant waiting and hope, for sure. Uh, well, we've come to the end of our time. Our hour is up, Phyllis. So, I'd like to thank you for everything that you shared with us tonight. Thank everyone out there for all your questions. And Phyllis, do you have anything else you'd like to leave us with? No, just thanks so much and, and have a great Christmas. I, I, I guess we'll do one of these in January. I don't know, but uh, um, thanks for coming to this one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good night.